Imagine a community of cattle farmers, all sharing a single field. Because they all share this one field, these cattle farmers face a dilemma. The more cows you have in the field, the better off you are. But as all the farmers add cow after cow, the field becomes depleted, and together, as a group, they suffer. This classic thought experiment is known as the tragedy of the commons, where individual self-interest comes up against the common good. Since this was introduced, we've come to understand that many of the environmental challenges we face follow this same script. Take Paulo, a farmer on the edge of the Brazilian Amazon. Paulo engages in slash and burn agriculture, where he clears plots to farm by burning them. Now, this is individually beneficial for Paulo, as it requires less effort than the alternatives. But everyone in his community slashing and burning is destroying the environment and making it farther and farther that he has to travel to find new plots. Here we see that tragedy of the commons, where individually slash and burn makes sense, but collectively the entire group does worse. We see that same dynamic in the life of Susan, a farmer in western Kansas. Susan draws her water from a well, and that well taps in to the Ogallala Aquifer. But decades of cheap and inefficient irrigation are threatening the supply of that aquifer, which in turn threatens Susan's way of life. Here again, we see that same dynamic, where individually, everyone does better drawing unsustainable amounts of water, but collectively, they all do far worse. Finally, take the case of Ruel. Ruel and his wife and three young children live in Tinimbak in northeastern Philippines. Ruel's father tells him stories of dragging a bucket through the water and coming up with fish, but Ruel never got to experience that. His father used a hook and line to make his catch, but the lack of fish in local waters has led Ruel to resort to dynamite and cyanide. Now, these destructive practices do make fishing easier for a well, but they destroy fish habitats. And without those habitats, the fish populations are depleted even further. Here again, we see that what's best for the individual is making it harder for the entire community to fish. Let's zoom in on this particular case, as over half the fish we eat comes from small-scale fishers like Ruel. I use that term fisher, recognizing that many of those doing this work are women. Now, these fishers tend to work in coastal waters, which includes the vast majority of the world's coral reefs. These reefs make up less than 1% of the ocean, but they account for 25% of its biodiversity. Less than 1% is 25%. That's why they've earned the nickname the rainforest of the sea. But these rainforests of the ocean are critically threatened by an epidemic of overfishing. And this overfishing has depleted fish populations to such an extent that they can no longer support the communities that once relied on them. A tragedy of the commons in its purest form. But what if I told you that a solution to this tragedy already exists? What if I told you that we could harness the power of behavioral science to solve these dilemmas all across the globe. We can find that solution in rural communities across the Philippines, which Ruel's case is a composite example of. Now, the Philippines is made up of thousands of islands, with over a million fishers working their coastal waters. But these fishers are the poorest workers in the entire country. They used to bring in 20 kilograms of fish a day, but today, that catches down to two kilos, a 90% decline. Now, there have been plenty of attempts at addressing overfishing, but these attempts have narrowly focused on regulation and top-down enforcement. And because of that narrow focus, these attempts have failed, and ecosystems and livelihoods across the globe are being destroyed. What we needed to recognize is that regulation is just one way of changing behavior. Instead, we need to avail ourselves of the entire behavior change toolkit. 
These tools drawn from behavioral science include social, contextual, and emotional motivators as well. The environmental organization RARE applied this behavior change toolkit to the problem of overfishing. And what they developed was a behaviorally informed solution which uses regulation, but also community-level social change to empower communities like Ruel's. They do this through three key behavioral science-informed steps. Step one is to generate collective demand. Step two is to coordinate a shift in behavior. And step three is to strengthen that new norm. Now, how are these steps applied in the case of Ruel? Well, let's start at the beginning. Ruel knows that his fishery is worse off, but he also feels helpless. Perisira langako, I am just a fisher. Now, Ruel doesn't know what's causing the fishery to collapse, and he certainly doesn't know what to do about it. But just as importantly, he knows that all his fellow fishers feel that same way. What we need to change here are the fishers' beliefs about what should be done, as well as what they think everybody else thinks should be done. We do this through activities like the fish game. So in the fish game, Ruel takes on the role of a fisher in his own community. And through the game's multiple rounds, he can feel the effect of different management strategies. He can see how when people follow the rules, catch goes up. When people don't, their catch goes down. Throughout the game, he also sees how individuals pursuing their own self-interest do better at the expense of everyone else. Throughout the game, Ruel is also encouraged to discuss with his fellow fishers what they think and feel. And through those discussions, he learns that the other fishers also think that they should change, and that they would all do better off if they did. In this way, the fish game generates collective demand. But is collective demand enough for behavior change? Despite the fact that this is when many nonprofits pick up anchor and sail away, simply generating collective demand is not enough, because collective demand is an attitude. And one of the most persistently documented effects in environmental psychology is the attitude-behavior gap. Changing attitudes is not enough to change behavior. And in the case of Ruel and Tinnenbach, simply creating collective demand is not enough for behavior change, as no one wants to change alone. That's to say, we need to coordinate our shift in behavior so that everyone knows that they're changing together. Rare does this through activities like public pledges. So at a pledge event, Ruel stands before his community and states that from this point forward, he will follow the rules of the fishery, including giving up dynamite and cyanide. Now, Ruel's pledge matters for his own behavior, but what matters far more is the fact that he sees everyone else making that same pledge. This reads, leads Ruel to adopt that key belief that everyone will be changing their behavior together, allowing him to change his own behavior without the risk of acting alone. Now, at this point, we've coordinated our shift in behavior, and people are following the rules of the fishery. But once the implementing staff leaves, will people continue to abide? Now, despite the fact that many interventions are trumpeted as successes for demonstrating behavior change, Oftentimes, later investigations find that they lacked any mechanism for making that change last. And in this case, we might call this new norm unstable, where any environmental or economic shock is more than enough to throw a well back to dynamite and cyanide. What the fishers recognize is that they need to change the beliefs again. They need everyone in the community to believe that if they were to violate the fishery rules, that someone would see, and that they'd have no excuse for doing so. Rare helps facilitate this through empowering local communities with their government partners to self-regulate, giving them the authority to establish their own fishery rules. Ruel and his fellow fishers use that authority to establish the Bantai Dagat, the guardians of the sea. 
With this voluntary sea patrol, Ruel goes on a Friday evening volunteer shift to patrol the local waters, making sure that everyone knows that if they were to violate the rules, that somebody's watching. Ruel also helps maintain the buoys, which mark the reserve area where no one's allowed to fish. Now, these buoys tell you where the reserve is, but far more important for behavior change, they eliminate any excuse for going into the reserve. Because you can't say you didn't know where the reserve was if you had to pass a giant orange buoy to get there. Now, by taking these three steps, Ruel and his community have achieved remarkable gains. Coral has grown back in Tindenbach by 20%, and fish biomass is up by 80%. But this story of success isn't confined to Tindenbach. Rare is working with hundreds of thousands of fishers across 10 countries with the goal of reaching a million fishers in the next five years. But these steps of generating collective demand, coordinating a shift in behavior, and strengthening the norm, they don't just apply to fish. Remember Paulo, our Brazilian farmer? These same steps could be used to shift Paulo from the individually beneficial slash and burn to the collectively beneficial sustainable agriculture. Remember Susan, our American farmer drawing from a quickly depleting aquifer? These same steps could be used to shift Susan and her fellow farmers to drawing sustainable amounts of water. Just like building collective demand, coordinating that shift in behavior, and strengthening the norm were the keys to unlocking a successful future for Ruel, so could they be for Paolo's crops, for Susan's water, and all those facing environmental cooperative challenges. Whether that's vehicle smog emission, or grazing cattle on public land, or even leave no trace in national parks. Now, I know these environmental challenges are daunting. But what we must always remember is that these problems are largely behavioral. And behavioral problems have behavioral solutions. In order to develop your own behavioral science-informed solution, you need to ask yourself these three questions. What can I do to generate collective demand, to get people to believe that everyone around them thinks they should change, and for them to think so as well? Second, what can I do to coordinate that shift in behavior, to get everyone to believe that everyone will change together? And finally, what can I do to strengthen the norm, to get people to believe that if they were to violate the rule, that someone would see, and that they'd have no excuse for doing so? Now, I know answering these questions isn't easy. I work at RARE's Center for Behavior and the Environment, and our goal is to apply behavioral science to help others solve environmental challenges. We want to help as many Ruels, Paulos, and Susans of the world as we can. But most of all, we want to make solving these environmental challenges simple, which is why we're launching an online cooperative behavior adoption guide for people to follow. This guide takes you through each of those three questions for any environmental cooperative challenge, whether that's protecting the land, the ocean, or the air. This guide will help you unpack and develop your own behavioral science-informed solution. Working together with Ruel, Paolo, and Susan, we can meet these challenges and solve these tragedies so people and nature thrive. Thank you.